there, and welcome to this episode of Force Ghost Conversations. This is your host, Anthony King, and this week I'm going to discuss highlights from the documentary Creating a Universe, The Making of Rebel Moon. If you're a fan of the podcast and would like to consider pledging your support, there will be a link in the episode description for you to check out the various tiers offered. Also, please be sure to check out our Tee Public store to buy some Force Ghost Conversations merchandise. And without further ado, it's time to gather around the campfire for some Force Ghost Conversations. All right, everybody, welcome back to Force Coast Conversations. I'm I'm excited to get into this episode here because this is a documentary that I've seen maybe about four times since it has come out. And it's kind of, I talk about my whiteboard all the time in this podcast. I have a whiteboard, of course, where I have listed all of the upcoming episodes I want to accomplish or get to at some point in the tenure of this podcast. And this one has been staring at me for quite some time here. Not that it's burning a hole in my pocket, so to speak, but I'm just excited to finally chat about it and uh, and just share some of the highlights that I want to note about this and the making of the Rebel Moon films as we know them right now. Um, so we'll just do that on the other side of this little segment here. Uh, this is where we typically would do Cloud City Gossip, but if you have listened to the podcast or followed us on social media perhaps for the last couple of days here or so you know that i'm currently out of the country right now so we had recorded this episode in advance and i don't really know a whole lot of the news that has taken place over the past week or so here um so this why this is going to be a little bit of a smaller segment as usual but if uh there's any news that comes out while i'm on vacation i will cover that as soon as we get back and uh, to a normal business recording schedule as you would typically expect here on Force Ghost Conversations. I did want to note one thing before jumping into our next segment here, which is that I've listened to the first episode of the um, Lighter Darker podcast, which is a podcast done by ILM, Industrial Light and Magic, and it is really awesome. I just wanted to give a plug to that podcast. Um, their first episode so far is out now, but maybe by the time that you're listening to this, there might be an episode or two out for you to further enjoy of that. And if you like behind the scenes stuff, which I think you might do if you're listening to this podcast by this point, or if you're going to continue listening to this podcast, which we're going to delve into some of behind the scenes stuff for the making of Rebel Moon in particular, um, then I think is right up your alley because ILM are visual effects wizards over there and they continue to blow my mind. And frankly, there are so many great tidbits within that first episode alone that I just wanted to give a wonderful plug to them. So make sure you go add that to your podcast feeds as uh, I hope they continue to make excellent content like they did with this first episode in the near future. I've also been really enjoying the uh, the Shenishal, which is the Rebel Moon based podcast about the creation of the Jimmies. Really excellent. I am just about at the sixth episode and the final episode of the Seneschal right now. So I uh, can't wait to conclude that. And they're really like 20 minute chunks of a podcast and it's full audio drama basically too. So it really gets back into this kind of old world radio drama in a way. This episodic nature of it too really plays into it. Um, so I like both mediums. Obviously I like podcasting. I think it's a great way to explore this universe even further with this wonderful story. And I hope that other big IPs kind of take an example from this. I know that Marvel's kind of dipped their hands into it a little bit. I think DC has as well, but those aren't necessarily canon to the larger stories overall. So I think that this could obviously play a big factor into that mantra moving forward. So be sure to check both of those out if you can. And of course, we'll be back on the other side of the short break with our discussion of creating a universe, the making of Rebel Moon. Hey, everybody, welcome back to Force Ghost Conversations. And again, like I said in the preamble, I'm excited to dive into this topic here, this creating a universe, the making of Rebel Moon, this really well done, I will say, quick 30 minute at most documentary that dives into the making of both, frankly, not just both movies, but like all four movies, frankly, right? We're talking the PG 13 cuts, both uh, Child of Fire and um, uh, Part Two, of course, which is uh, I'm drawing a blank on right now. Oh, I'm pulling it up right now. Don't worry, folks. I got it right here. Uh, Child of Fire and The Scar Giver. And then, of course, both director's cuts as well, which I still actually haven't seen to this moment yet in time. Um, I've been waiting for the right moment to actually dive into them and dissect them. And I think you all have kind of known that I've been traveling a bit of late and obviously I have a full time job at the same time. And uh, just trying to balance all that together, too. Um, and these are 
frankly, three hour movies and they deserve the time and space. And I want to watch them on my sound system rather than on a flight on my iPhone or iPad with terrible Wi-Fi or downloaded onto that surface. Like it just does. It's not the experience I want it to have. And I feel like these movies deserve that experience and that methodical kind of approach to it. I, you know, clearly after watching this, I really want to do that because a lot of these people put a lot of hard work and effort into making this movie. I think that's very clear from the start. Even if you don't like Rebel Moon, if you're not a fan of it, you're not a fan of Zack Snyder, you're like, I, I don't like his stuff. I think those are, if it's fair to say you don't like the work of a, of a certain person, right? It's a stylistic director. That's totally fine. There's no problem with that. Now, if you're using hate and other things like that to monetize or, you know, take advantage of situations, uh, because of that, then that's a different conversation entirely. It's okay not to like something and not watch it because you have certain taste preferences. Like, that's okay to me. Um, but I think it, even with that, you could still say, even after watching this half hour or all that, that, you could say, like, wow, a lot of people put a lot of hard work and dedication into making this the best that it possibly could be. Now, I think I haven't seen the R-rated versions yet, but I can imagine, right, like, there's probably some discourse that we'll probably discuss in their future when we talk about those films specifically, about the choice between making a PG-13 version, an R-rated version, knowing that there was going to be a director's cut, uh, how that played into the release and the reception of these films. Like, I think that's all valid conversations to have when it comes to talking about this movie. And it might even be a thing that is studied, frankly, in the near future about the streaming model and the streaming world that we currently live in. But I will say that, again, you see the... the, the, the theories behind making this this film, right? The concept art that goes behind it the actors and actresses giving 110 percent the production design team literally creating a farm in california and going through that whole process there creating a a, a river a pool basically uh, as production required it that they could shoot on um the visual effects work is totally top notch top tier for the 160 million dollar budget what they were able to get out of basically four movies I mean, that's a dream for people right there, right? If you look at right, two hour, two two hour films, um, roughly, plus, so you're looking at four hours there, plus another three and a half, which is the first one. So you're at seven and a half hours, plus another three, roughly, for um, part two. You're looking at 10 and a half hours of something on a $160 million budget. And I think when you add up all the costs in this day and age of looking at budgeting and costs for different things, then you get, I think, a pretty good out product at the end of the day. So, you know, even if you just respect the the making of film and the process behind it, uh, I think this is a great documentary that highlights the work and tremendous effort that was put into making Rebel Moon uh, what it is. And what I would argue is a good success and a start of a fantastic uh, open opportunity franchise that I think Netflix could potentially mine for the next 10 years or so. Who knows? Uh, still yet to be determined yet where we're going with this. I mentioned the Seneschal podcast in the um, Cloud City Gossip segment of this podcast. But you, yeah, as of now, there hasn't been an announcement of a uh, part three part whatever parts however many parts they would announce at once if they would do another two at, at the same time just to, for cast and all that stuff to keep it all together um but obviously with the comics that they're throwing in with the blood axes the seneschal the four films that are now out um they're they're going all in in some ways into this endeavor so hey if you're here for it you're here for it if not it's all it's all good as long as it's within uh um you know, a fair game, good hearted with nature of saying, I don't like that. Um, but let's, uh, let's talk about this little documentary here. And, and, uh, I will say just to make sure that you don't miss it, right. If you go to rebel moon, uh, either part one, part two, the director's cuts, you will see that, uh, there's like a little like section at the bottom of all that, that is titled, Rebel Moon Collection, and that's where most likely you will find this creating a, a universe documentary set. Or you can do the search, or maybe it comes up at the end of uh, your watch of part two. Um, that's what happened when I watched part two the first time. Then it was like, hey, there's this creating a universe, the making of Rebel Moon documentary. 
And then they went in all, I went immediately watched it because I was like part two rocks. I need to hear more about how this came together and all that stuff. So just really cool stuff overall within this documentary. Uh, I, you know, I'm a fiend for these kind of behind the scenes details um, and just learning about the process of how imagery and film comes to life. I mean, the first thing I just wanted to talk about is how literally they created a new camera for the shooting style for this endeavor, right? They took this Japanese lens from the 60s, this camera lens that they're like, I want to use Zach. Basically, Zach, not even they. Zach was like, I really want to use this for this project here. Um, but they're like, this lens doesn't exist on the cameras that we currently use, right? The Netflix, not everybody, everybody uses digital cameras nowadays. Let's be honest about this. There's no one really using film unless there's some sort of auteur, auteur uh, filmmaker. Uh, and even if they are, right, I, basically when people have that grainy image that you expect from film nowadays, it's just a filter that they put on uh, the digital camera just because of the ease and simplicity and cost effectiveness of using digital cameras. It's just the way that things are done these days. Um, but to literally take this lens and put it on uh, this new camera, they, they created a whole new camera for this thing, which is just mind blowing how they were able to do that. And Zach loved the way that it reflected off of like the, um, the the wheat and the, and how it really implemented the the farming sequences that I think are really pivotal to the heart and nature of the story here, um, and how natural that is. Uh, I think that really adds to just the visual storytelling that comes out here. So just that one minor detail that I mean, not even a minor detail. I think this is a pretty huge detail. Uh, I might be underselling it here at the end of the day. But with that, uh, I think that just provides this wonderful foundation for the type of effort and thought process that was into this. And just how, you know, you hear the cast and crew talking about this this um, endeavor and how they were like, this is such a collaborative effort across the board like even just from its simple origins of zach being like oh i think it would be cool to do a sci-fi seven samurai movie kind of in space and just thinking through the mythology of it i mean this guy is literally a mythology world builder maestro <laughs> in, in putting it in some way to categorize that i mean like we're talking like i, I don't want to get too far in the weeds here but like tolkien level uh, of thought processes here right he's literally created this like bible of the world and and the information about the kings that have been passed down and uh, how the senate works and the mother world like that's how you get the seneschal from this right it's like um you have to have something and, and then one leads to another i mean george R. R. martin is also very good at this thing too where they kind of get sidetracked by oh well i have a new theory about how this person does this and and uh that that influences this story along the line you just kind of get lost in your own world and i think that's definitely possible with rebel moon i would love to see like a tabletop rpg about this or even like an, a massive open world rpg video game uh set in this universe that could also explore a lot of these different aspects of the galaxy um so basically even like, we're talking about the world building and even like admiral noble staff like how that's a part of an old world weapon and that and how he chooses that to kind of have his ownership uh or, or at least takeover of this aspect of himself and just how brutal and methodical it is in order to uh take out his victims right like that those are wonderful details i think gets overlooked when you just watch the film the first time or uh that oh, frankly only a behind the scenes detail can really give to you across the across the board here but you can't deny that zach is a wonderful world builder at the end of the day and um I think that there is a lot of, again, opportunity here for more fruitful storytelling. But I did, again, want to go back to my thought there about the collaborative nature here. So everybody was like, hey, I think this is a cool idea. Or, um, or I think, for example, the, the biggest thing that comes to mind is like the actor who plays Tarek being like, oh, I got to basically create the language here when I talk to the Bennu, right? And I'm using just the... I, I don't want to misspeak here, but I think he said uh, like he mixed Portuguese and Russian uh, into this, and he included his children's names into this language here. Um, so just created a, a new language that he was speaking to this, this mythical creature with. And all that comes into play here. I think it's just so cool that actors can feel special and involved in the project and involved in the creative process and it gives them a lot more ownership at the end of the day when it comes to all the things that are put on display here now clearly everything is so very physical within this movie right i think that's undeniable across the board 
it's crazy to think that uh <laughs> you know the stunt teams uh, did such, such amazing work when it comes to putting this movie to together at the end of the day right i think you they showed many behind the scenes snippets of them kind of giving getting a directive and then going back into their studio in order to pre it out and and to do all the tracking of where the people are supposed to be and how it should look and all that and then they implement it on final acting day and the actors the stunt people first would do the the take and then just seeing how cool it was and the actors would be like oh let's do it uh maybe we could do it right sophia batella certainly enticed michael hussman to um do that as well uh, a couple times and you know they, I think they showed them diving into the pool that they create which we'll talk about in a second here um, just really excellent stuff here uh, and I love when when actors are definitely inspired by the work being done it showcases in the performance that they do and again like I said you feel ownership at the end of the day of the work being done which I think is so pivotal in these creative endeavors especially when you're launching this brand new universe here that Marvel Moon is definitely trying to do I got to talk about the production uh they literally built this town of velt uh this village this farming community and this is and they showcased the kind of hillside california space that netflix took over for a year and built up this not only just the village town spaces like the the meeting areas and the dining halls and and the homes the huts uh, but also these, like, this is river that runs through it. They engineered this together where they basically made a full on swimming pool that looks like a river and put that where it needed to be, of course, in the space. And then naturally they farmed, um, <laughs> they just, you know, freaking farmed, uh, wheat in the space, plotted a whole area of wheat and then literally, harvested it at the appropriate time when it was required right you see it in the movie it's a very pivotal part in my opinion we talked about that in our part two conversation so go check that out with craig dickinson of course from reading between the reels where we talk in depth about this farming sequence and how pivotal it is to the character motifs and becoming one with this community overall um it's wild how, how they fir first thought that they thought that they could control the production schedule without the wheat being there to like, if it wasn't fully matured wheat, right. Ready to be harvested, then it would look odd and they'd have to do more visual effects. So they were like, basically we're going to ship production schedule and around in order to make it so that the wheat tells us when we're ready to go. Uh, and the fact that they were able to be flexible enough as a cast and crew in order to make that possible, I think it's just like kudos to everybody on board. Cause you know, that could be a very stressful uh, process overall and uncertain process I imagine too. So, gosh I can, I can only imagine the, the the stressful days across the board when it comes to that but it really does show at the end product i know zach also had like some wheat literally harvested or not to say harvested yet but planted at his home so they could keep track of where it was at in the process of its maturity so that they would know when it, okay we're getting close to when this should be harvested here which i think is such a cool and neat detail you probably don't get in too many films these days but i think it probably stems from some of his man of steel work of course with the, the cornfields and stuff so that's intimately involved with the farming process when it comes to the making of his films Another cool detail that I noticed is that Jimmy wasn't just fully CG, right? It was this mix of practical and real uh, and visual effects as well. Not only was it Anthony Hopkins doing the voice, of course, that they got to hear on set, but it was also an actor in the suit who was also the actor that played the bartender of that brothel scene in part one. But it was, uh, I got uh, his name right here because I wanted to make sure I, I properly uh, attributed this work here. Dustin Seidham sighthammer i uh, hope i pronounced that right uh literally plays as the guy inside the suit and i just think does a phenomenal job and it's not just this cgi thing that people didn't have like just had to imagine in their minds now they actually got to see a person doing the full physical work that was needed to make this process happen i think there was just so many uh, practical things in the set particularly when you think of that uh brothel sequence there and the just the creation of some of the technology required for this uh just Really well done across the board, I will say. Uh, but also visual effects too. They, I know they focused in the documentary on the Bennu sequence, which I think was really well done, and also creating a lot of the um, Mother World ships, uh, the the Dreadnought, uh, some of the drop ships that were uh, required for the main battle sequence. 
all really well done across the board. The the again the the blend of Harmada being a, a wonderful mix of practical and visual effects. Look, everyone was on board with this thing, right? Uh, and I think when you see this kind of work being put on behind the scenes, it just only goes to heighten that wonderful experience that you have when watching this thing. And it makes me want to see more of this. I can't really get an, a whole. I, I'm I'm enticed by this whole universe here i wanted to learn more about it i hope we get a part three uh in film form i would love to see the, the stories expanded into many different directions here and i think that there is a lot to uh say about rebel moon and the and the story and and just where it can go in the future here princess isa is apparently out there and uh well spoilers for part two everybody if you haven't seen it yet but um i i just i'm very excited for the making of this and it's clear that Everyone is behind the scenes, 100% involved and and really loving the work and, and uh, being a part of this process here. It seemed like it was a very collaborative functioning set. Um, and uh, yeah, make, just makes me all the more excited for more, which I hope we get in the near future very soon here. So I know this was a shorter episode of Forest Ghost Conversations, but I did want to share some highlights that I saw from this documentary. And I also implore you to go check it out yourself because obviously I can't cover everything in this podcast itself. And it's only 30 minutes long too. So, I mean, frankly, <laughs> I was going to cover everything just by nature of talking about uh, everything in detail here as we typically do. Um, so, of course, we will be back next time next week with a brand new episode. Uh, this actually will be a very special episode of Forest Ghost Conversation. We've got the Blast Points guys coming on board to chat all things Indiana Jones in the Dial of Destiny celebrating its one year anniversary. So be on the lookout for that. And of course, we'll be back fully in person here. Um, so both of these episodes, both this and next week's are pre-recorded episodes, um, obviously because I'm out in uh, Paris. So um, definitely enjoying my vacation. I, I'm speaking for myself on that point. I am definitely enjoying myself over there. And uh, I look forward to coming back and giving everybody a full trip report. And maybe we can entice you to go to Disneyland Paris as well in the near future. And uh, again, if you haven't checked out our episode last week with Mercedes Gleason from the Chat Disney Podcast, I explore, implore you to do that as well so that uh, you can get excited for all the things that I am definitely excited about. And then you're all caught up with our conversations when we get back um, from our week-long trip. So uh, with that, folks, I look forward to uh, I look I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you enjoy next week's episode as well. And uh, very soon we'll be back with a totally brand new episode in your podcast feeds. And until then, may the force be with you. Take care.